of all, today you're either really going to be helped or you're really going to hate me. <laughs> it's all or nothing, right? I need to take a deep breath before I get this out. Anybody have demands on them that are impossible and crushing? I'm glad you lifted both of your hands up there, brother. I love you too. I feel the same way. I have to be cautious about going down this road because I come to encourage you, I come to teach, but I also have to live by the same faith that I proclaim. And there are times... I hate to call you my friends because you're my family. But there are times when the demands are overwhelming. No one knows what somebody goes through. Now people say, oh yeah, I know all about it. No one knows until you've been there. In fact, even if you have walked a parallel universe, no two people are the same. No no two people have the same uh, suffering. There's no two people that are alike. We're so unique. But I ask you the question because sometimes I have demands that are placed on me that are so overwhelming. Now I know that the Lord provides and the Lord is our supply. But sometimes those demands have both fists in my face and they are relentless. They, they don't go away. Now... If you're listening for the first time today, or you came as a guest, or you're looking for the cheery pastor that never lives and never has a moment of sorrow, you've come to the wrong place. The reason that I can speak so boldly about the faith that I have is I live it. I live in this book, and I walk by that faith, the true faith, Sometimes, I think we, we go looking for things that don't exist. They're fantasy in our minds. In fact, I was telling one of the staff people, I said, you know, that's the wonderful thing about books. I'm just going to take a sidebar for a minute. Books, people are fantasy writers. They can write out their whole fantasy universe. But for those of us who are not writers, we can have fantasy land in our brain (laughs) of how, for example, my fantasy land is how the church ought to be and how the people of God ought to be and how life for the faither ought to be. Fantasy land. (laughs) And then you wake up in the morning, you open your eyes, and you open your eyes to reality, and the reality is that it's not fantasy land. I have zero tolerance for those Christians that seem to be always... They're all in the clouds all the time. They're not in the clouds or under the clouds. They're all in the clouds, and I really, that scares me. So what what I hope to do today is show you out of God's Word something that, um, although on the surface doesn't appear maybe to apply to us all, but if you take away that surface approach and you dig a little deeper, you find that... uh, we all fit here. So I'm going to ask you to turn to Second Kings and the fourth chapter. And um, let me just tell you, I do have a fascination with Elijah and Elisha. I've told you many times, one of the messages I delivered between the two, I said that Elijah's miracles tended to be those of destruction and Elisha's tended to be those of picture of a resurrected life. And I'm not saying which is better or worse. One represents the master, the other the servant. Sometimes we, um, we can go through these passages. We read, as I've said for many weeks now, we read of these Bible people. But if you stop long enough and you quit reading as I've said, one person who used to say, 
good little Bible stories. If they're just good little Bible stories to you, you should probably go to a good little church where all the people are good and little in it. <laughs> and, and if you don't know what I'm talking about, don't worry. It doesn't matter. It's not relevant. All right. Okay. Second Kings, fourth chapter, and I would like to just read briefly. Now they cried a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets unto Elisha, saying, Thy servant, my husband, is dead. Thou knowest that thy servant did fear the Lord, and the creditor is come to take unto him my two sons to be bondmen, to be slaves. Elisha said unto her, What shall I do for thee? Tell me, what hast thou in the house? And she said, Thine handmaid hath not anything in the house save a pot of oil. And he said, Go borrow thee vessels abroad of all thy neighbors, even empty vessels. Even as italicized, it's added, Borrow not a few. That's also a really poor way of saying, Go and get as many as you can. And when thou art come in, thou shalt shut the door upon thee and upon thy sons, Thou shalt pour out into all those vessels. Thou shalt set aside that which is full. So she went from him, shut the door upon her and her, upon her sons, who brought the vessels to her. She poured out. It came to pass when the vessels were full, full that she said to her son, Bring me yet a vessel. He said, to, he said unto her, There is not a vessel more. That's it. And the oil stayed. There was no more. The oil ceased, stopped. And she came and told the man of God, and he said, Go sell the oil, pay the debt, and live thou and thy children of the rest. Now, you know, you can read through this, and you can read through Second Kings, in fact, and read the miracles of Elisha and not see their relevance. You know, I've read people who write commentaries, and they say things like, Well, Elisha's miracles, and they just, there's no rhyme or reason for them, but God doesn't do anything without perfect reason. And what I love about this is the miracles of this fourth chapter. There are miracles of mercy. Now, I only read one, but there are miracles of mercy. And this particular miracle, if you were counting the miracles, this is the fifth miracle in a whole line of miracles. Um, but this is what I, I love about this, and this is why I said you, we need to find ourselves in this passage. You see, until we lift these things off the page and we begin to make them something applicable to us, they just remain, as I've said for weeks, they're just things on paper. We know them, we've read them, until we begin to apply them. I want you to see first this woman, and here is a destitute woman. Bereavement has come into her house. In fact, I wrote down some D words here, uh, kind of an old style of doing things, but I wrote down death first because death had occurred in her house. Now, just looking in the congregation here, there are people who have lost husbands and wives, and I use that term very carefully. Their spouses have been promoted, and some it's sons and some it's daughters right in this congregation. And we don't know why. We can't explain these things, but this woman, and that's why I said I want you to put flesh and blood on her. I want you to make her real today, not just another reading is going through a terrible time, and we do not know much about the husband except that the husband was a man of faith. He was part of that school of the sons of the prophets. So we know that he served God and he was faithful. And people would say, well, listen to the logic. You hear people say, if you're really serving God, none of these things will happen to you. Well, here's a, here is a woman who was a faithful wife of a man who was serving God, whose sons remained in her house, and yet 
this thing still happened in her household. I want you to see that almost every person in this room will be touched by something like that. That makes you just like the people in the Bible, not like the people that profess to be Christians who never have anything happen to them. I want you to see that. I'm going to keep going on this subject of telling you how much you are like the people in the Bible until you start actually believing it. And no matter what the rest of the world thinks about what Christianity is and what faith is, you look and say, you see, I'm just like that one right there. There are demands on me that are crushing me that I can barely take. I want you to see this woman who her sons will be sold, which was the law, by the way. If she couldn't pay a debt, her sons would be sold to pay that debt, and they would be taken as slaves. She has no way of providing for her sons. We know that we'll, we'll get to that in a minute. She has no way of providing for them. She has no money. She has, when she's asked, she says she has nothing, not a thing. Demands she cannot possibly meet in the flesh. Now, if I can't help some of you today, maybe I'll help a few of you. So, for some, it may not be like this woman who's facing these pressures, but I put down in my D words, death, debt. If she couldn't pay the debt, she'd lose her sons. And chances are, if she couldn't pay the debt, she'd probably end up losing her house. And chances are, if she couldn't pay the debt, she too would probably be sold. Death, debt, the demands, just the demands of, of feeding her family. Now, you know, the beautiful thing about the Bible is who is the beneficiary of this miracle that's about to happen? A destitute person. A destitute person. So I have a very simple lesson today. It's so simple, that's why I said you may just hate me. When you leave here, you'll say, that's it? I came to church to be illuminated. <laughs> I guarantee you'll be illuminated all right. Why don't you look at this woman? Now, for most people, we'd say the beneficiary of this miracle should be someone who doesn't have these problems. She doesn't have the pressure. There's, there is a sense of urgency. You know, we read this, and because we read it, and, and this chapter has not moved out of my Bible ever. There's no urgency. Do you know what I'm saying? This chapter has not moved. It's been here. No urgency. But to the woman who was speaking to the prophet, there was a sense of urgency that if something didn't happen real quick, there was going to be dire consequences. Now do you know where I am? Yes, Good. Because I don't think I could take it if, you were, if you'd say no. I don't think I could take it. <laughs> dire consequences if something didn't happen immediately. Now listen to what the prophet says to her. What shall I do for thee? I want you to notice this because this is the way God does this through his book. When they saw Jesus coming, speak of the one who was blind, who cried out, Oh, son of David, have mercy. But he was crying out. He didn't, he didn't say, you know, I'm blind, but what I really need is a loaf of bread. He spoke about his desperate need of his blind eyes to be healed. He didn't give him a laundry list of, here, Jesus, these are my five items as you pass by. I took the liberty of writing them on a scroll in case you didn't have time, I just hand them to you. Because you're God, you can. The man cried out what was the most urgent thing, his most urgent need. But many times we find Jesus asking the people, that he encounters, what would you have me do? That's why I said, God, it's wonderful to read God's word and know he does not change. What 
shall I do for thee? Tell me. But here's the better question. What hast thou in the house? Now, I want you to think about this for a second, because if I was that woman, and some of you'd be just like this, you'd say, now wait a minute. I came to the prophet of God, Elisha, asking him for help, urgent help, and he's asking, what I have in the house? you got to be kidding me. I was expecting this miracle request to happen some other way. Think of how skewed our thinking is. When we come to God and we come asking, we suppose that the method God will use will be one of our own mindset that we can even reach to. Well, he says, what do you have in the house? And the handmaid, she says, thine handmaid hath not anything in the house. Let's make this a little more colloquial because I, I just like to say nothing. Nothing but a jar of oil. And I want you to see this woman's house, too. I want you to visually imagine empty containers everywhere. And if not empty containers, maybe just one container pushed very remotely to the back of a shelf somewhere, seemingly the least likely thing, maybe the least plausible thing to be used. Nothing but a pot of oil. Now, I seldom put titles on sermons. I don't... We have other people that like to do that for me, I guess. But I would say if you ask me what's needed here for all of us, you have demands facing you you can't possibly meet. Now, maybe they're not like this woman where you've got debt and you've got things that you just don't, you don't know how this is all going to work out and the panic of it all and the urgency of it all, perhaps. I'd like to say this is like a little bit of something and a whole lot of God. Just takes a little bit of something sometimes. And what's so interesting about this is the discovery that's made in all of this. You see, I think sometimes when the demands of life get to the point where we feel we just can't do it, a great discovery is made. Here it comes. I'm going to do this quickly. I did deliver at least five or six messages to you on this subject. When you come to the end of yourself, you will come to the beginning of God. When you come to the end of yourself, your ability to provide, your ability to solve the problem, your self-sufficiency, you will come to the beginning of God. Until then, you'll just be flailing around trying to still solve your problems. And I think God will let you flail for a while until you're exhausted, spent, tired, and broken. The prophet says, Go borrow the vessels abroad from all thy neighbors. Empty vessels. Borrow not a few. Just get get as many as you can. Now, not said in here, not, not even clearly said in here, but so self-evident, the requirement of the woman to be obedient to the Word of God. You see, I said it's so simple sometimes that when this is presented, you'll say, but shouldn't there be something more? Obedience to the Word of God spoken by this prophet, to go and get all the vessels, go to your neighbors, get empty vessels, get as many as you can. And here are the instructions. When thou art come in, thou shalt shut the door upon thee and upon thy sons. You come in and you close the door. Why? I want to keep the door open for a little ventilation, Elisha. I don't like closed quarters. You ever meet people that are just so ornery when it comes to the things of God and God's way, and they're so determined to do it their way and not in obedience? These are the things that, as your pastor, this drives me crazy. And I can say that to you because some of you, I love you dearly, but you do that. I tell you, don't try and you've made a mess, whatever the mess is, maybe you're not to blame for your mess, but you have a mess, don't try and Start fidgeting around to solve the problem. Be obedient to God's word. Listen to what God's word has to say to you. 
And until you're acting on that word, don't try and find some other solution that's going to be the temporary band-aid that will bring you more grief. Why do you say shut the door? Come in and shut the door. I love this. If you read in Mark's Gospel, in the fifth chapter, in the 40th verse, you read about when Jesus came for the daughter uh, Jairus' laying there and looks like she's dead. And in that 40th verse of the 5th chapter, he shut the door. He basically threw everybody that was in the house. He threw them out. Why? Because they were laughing at him. It was a joke. Shut the door. Please see this because... You will never understand my heart and why I walk around so perplexed. You turn on the TV at midnight, you can't sleep. You turn on the TV at midnight, and some guy in a real fancy gold and silver zoot suit is on TV telling you how all the people just got healed. Let me ask you something. How do the miracles, most of the miracles occur? Go in and shut the door. Why? Because there's going to be scoffers and spectators and people who ridicule. Go in and shut the door. People say, I'm very different, that this church is so different. And why is it so different? Well, I'm looking at God's Word and I'm thinking to myself, it's so different because we believe what the Word of God says. The rest of the world wants to make the spectacle so that the scoffers and the people who laugh can make ridicule and, as the King James calls it, make sport. I love that word. Because that has multiple meanings, of course. And if you've been around any amount of time, I love the fact that sport actually suits some of those people as well. The ones wearing those suits. Anyway. (laughs) Etymology.com. Go there. I don't know if that's a website. I just made that up. But look it up to sport in the old English language, yes, and then you can tell me later. It was ha, 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 ha. All right. Go in and close the door. You know, when Jesus healed people, he heals this man, and he says, go and tell no one, but go and show yourself to the priest, and then make the proper offerings. And the reason for that was in Jesus' day, People so disbelieved, it didn't matter how many miracles Jesus performed. It did not matter. There would still be people laughing in disbelief and mocking. So he says, go and tell no one. He didn't say, go and tell no one, because trust me, he knew the man along the way was going to say, I'm healed, I'm healed. (laughs) Yes. But go and tell no one, go show the priest. So I love the fact that if you're really looking for God's will and God's way. It's right here. Go in and shut the door. This is not a spectacle for your neighbors to be entertained. This isn't a spectacle so that now your neighbors will believe because they've seen this incredible thing happen. This is not being performed for the benefit of the audience. This, dear woman, is being performed for you and your sons. A miracle of mercy. Go in and shut the door. And how many times have we asked for miracles? And we have. I mean, if we're... Listen, if I'm the only person that's done this, and I know I'm not, not show me a sign, but you ask for a miracle. You ask for God, just, could you just do this thing? Whatever the thing is. Could you just do it? I, I really need a miracle. But you realize that most of the time, I hate to say this to you, most of the time when we're asking for these things, we're not even taking into consideration, and I'll I'll come to this, the asking factor, of course, nothing wavering, but go shut the door. If this is your prayer to God, go pray in secret. Go shut the door. It's not just the petition that matters. I look at this and I think these are clear instructions. Now, from the man of God... To this woman, giving the instructions, shut the door upon thee and upon thy sons, and thou shalt pour out into all those vessels, and thou shalt set aside that which is full. 
I want you to see the obedience of this woman to carry out exactly what the man of God said. And then not in here. I also want you to picture her sons helping her as they brought these empty vessels. She took from this one, what do you have in your house? Nothing except a jar of oil. She took from this jar, and I don't envision that it was a large one either. I envision it was probably a small one. But she took from this, and I envision the sons coming and bringing the vessels and holding up the vessels. And I can, I can see, I don't know if these were terribly young children or not, but I envision in my mind, reading between the lines, some very big eyes from a little child watching as these vessels were being filled up and vessel after vessel. And I imagine small hands sturdily holding on to these vessels as they became heavier and heavier as they began to be filled up. And I'm saying to you, as we come sometimes into God's presence and we're asking for something, trying to meet the demands in our own flesh which we cannot, and needing for God to provide, we should be as, and I'm reading between the lines, as these children, it's not there, it doesn't say this, but as these children helping her with steady hands that when we do indeed hold up a vessel to be filled, it's not with an uneven hand or a shaking hand, but we come with a steady hand, the hand of amen, the hand that says, I have run, I have leaned, I'm holding firm this vessel to be filled of God, of exactly what God deigns to fill it with. Nothing more nothing less. I love the obedience of this picture. She asked for another vessel, and there were no more vessels, and then the oil stopped. Now, it's kind of interesting, because if you were to read this just kind of quick like that, she could not meet the demands that were being made on her to pay a debt, to save her son, to spare her household, except that this miracle happened, She goes and she tells the man of God, and he said, Go and sell the oil, pay the debt, and live thou and thy children of the rest. I'm wondering between these few verses, it's just seven verses all in all, I'm wondering how much fear the woman had that this doom might actually come fulfilled upon her household had the impossible not happened. I said to you, if I was going to put a title on this, I'd say a little bit of something and a whole lot of God. And oftentimes, the same question is asked of us. It's not asked audibly. What do you have in your house? We are a lot more... Our inclination is to believe we are a lot more bankrupt spiritually than we actually are. Our inclination is, because we live in such a greedy society, to believe we need a whole lot more to get by when, in fact, we have a whole lot more than most people will ever have. And then here's the discovery. She could meet the demands when she came to the end of herself. I can't meet the demands as pastor of this church in the flesh. I can tell you what I would hope for you, what I would pray for you, what I would ask of you, and then there are the demands put on me, and I know full well that it's Im- without God, it's impossible. That's why I asked you the first question. Is anybody facing that type of a pressure now? Did somebody come into this building today facing the very demands, maybe they're not exactly like this widow, but the very demands that if something urgently does not happen, the consequences are dire. And when we finally come to the end of ourselves, you know, that's why I love the Psalms. We read that Psalm over and over again, if you commit your way unto the Lord, and that's wonderful, but you can commit your way unto the Lord and still be trying to solve the problem. You ever done that? (laughs) <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> because I thought I was, I'd be alone here holding my hand up. 
Now let's talk about the vessels for a minute, and I'm going to take some liberty now. The woman had to have the expectancy that the word of God would be true. If you've come to the end of yourself and the beginning of God, you must have an expectancy. Not only is God's word true, but he will make his word come to pass exactly as he said. I imagine these children bringing these vessels after the first one, by the way, after the first one, automatically running to get more because it became natural, the expectancy for there to be more. Now, there are many people that preach the blessings of God and they tell you about how things are overflowing and they're going everywhere and you might need a napkin to wipe yourself off afterwards. (laughs) But when I say expecting for God to fill the vessel, God will fill the vessel that is emptied, that is surrendered. You know, I've told you the story. Many, many times I bugged Dr. Scott. I mean, I'm, I'm surprised he, he, didn't, <laughs> he didn't have a Mount Vesuvius explosion with me. But I bugged him for the longest time because I, we used to have these discussions about speaking in tongues. And I said, talk to me about talking in tongues. I want to know about speaking in tongues. And I just really, oh, Poor Dr. Scott. Honestly, I did. I tortured him. I have, I have to confess to you. I just, with my questions, and on and on and on and on. But I remember him saying something to me, which I was too spiritually mature back then to understand when he would say, if you keep asking God, expecting. And I really didn't, even though I heard the words, and I know what that means, but I, I really didn't connect the dots. The dots were there, simply put. God is not going to fill something in this day and age that hasn't been brought to him empty and surrendered. This woman, forget about the vessels that he filled, this woman was empty in her household, in her, we'll call it the possibilities of solving the problem, emptied. If I was going to add to this seven verses, I'd put, but God emptied. I hear people talking about the blessings of God and the blessings of God, but you will not experience those blessings until you've come to the end of yourself. So the expectancy that God would, acting in faith, I want you to see these children bringing the vessels, acting in faith as though, even though there was no guarantee they brought the vessels to be filled again until there were no more vessels, no more empty vessels, and then the oil stopped. And that is the way God does things. Now, people talk about things that are overflowing and pouring over. Do you think God, God can waste if he wants? But most of the time, he's pouring and filling up that which is empty. And he does. He fills it to the brim. Most of the time, we're busy sticking our hands and our feet in the way so that it can never get filled up because 50% of the way, we feel like we've made it. We're a success. Stop the pouring. Yes, I just had to get that out of my system. So I want you to see this act of faith, expectancy, obedience, and then... I'd like to come back to the whole picture and ask you, because it's just human nature. See, we never want to disclose. We seldom do want to disclose the things we cannot do. It's humiliating. You know, to be mastered by something that you cannot, you cannot for once in your life, or maybe for twice or three times, or many, it's multiple times, You just can't get mastery over this one thing. You cannot defeat this one thing. I want you to think of the people in the Bible that God has done similar to this woman, a similar setting. You know, each time we've taught on Hagar and Ishmael, it's always been Ishmael was not the child of promise. And when... 
there's, when they're sent out, they're sent out that morning, Hagar, and that's the handmaid, and Ishmael, which is the product, the works product in the tent. If you don't know that one, I suggest you get a Bible and read it. It's in Genesis. It's a wonderful way to learn the Bible. (laughs) But Hagar is being sent away with her son. And it says in the morning, she's sent away with a little bit of bread and a little bit of water. And it is at that moment when the bread is gone and the water is gone that God speaks. You know, people talk about Hagar, and, you know, Hagar is not in this favorable light, but God yet spoke. And we know that God bestowed favor right there, that the boy shouldn't die, neither one of them should die of starvation or lack of water. Right at the end of what appears to be, that's it. God provides, even for those who are maybe not the most beloved in his book. So I'm saying to you, if you take a look at the people that fit this profile, this isn't just the widow right here, or Hagar and Ishmael. There's another picture. I mean, if you think about it, there's, these pictures reoccur throughout Scripture. As Jesus finishes feeding the 5,000, And he sends his disciples off to pray. And he is left alone there. They get into the boat. They're on the other side of the lake. The wind kicks up. It's nighttime. There's no master. There's no light. And by the fourth watch, I mean a storm, a tumult, they think this is the end. It's always the same thing. Until we come to the end of ourselves. And then we, once we are at the end, We actually begin. That's the beginning of understanding how God works. This is no different. So I just want to say this to you, because I came here today. I came here with a very heavy heart, facing demands. I'm I'm sure God knows. If he asked me now, what do you have inside the house? I'd be like the woman, say nothing but a little bit of oil in a jar. That's enough. I think sometimes we put God in this capsule. He can only be this big. He can only do these very small things. But you know, through and through this Bible, he's called the God of impossibilities. Now maybe your issues today, it's not death in your household or someone who's critically ill or the ramifications of that, maybe something instant or something that has been eroding your household, or maybe eating away at your faith. I want you to remember this today because no matter what, I look at the person who benefited from the miracle. It wasn't the onlookers. It wasn't the neighbors. It wasn't the brother and sister so-and-so. It was the destitute woman. And she became the beneficiary of this miracle, not because she merited it, not because she was such a good woman and such a godly woman. She came, she petitioned, she asked. And if we ask nothing wavering, that's why I use the reference of the picture of the children bringing these empty vessels to be filled up. And I see even the hand or hands of a child that are not as strong holding these containers with strong hands and large eyes watching as this miracle happens, but the hands are steady as the vessels are being filled up. This would not have happened had the woman said stoically, well, we'll just suffer the consequences, kids. We can't go ask because God's favor is not upon our household. Look, you see? This is what we get convinced of by the church world. The church world comes in and says, you see, you're out of God's will. You've done something so terribly wrong, and this is why your whole world is off kelter. No. The next time, if it's even today, I want you to look at this woman, and instead of seeing this woman like 
uh, seven verses of a story that have no application, I want you to open the book and say, here are seven verses where somewhere between these verses I find myself needing, maybe that's some of our problem today. Maybe some of us are not at the end of ourselves. We just keep thinking we've been wrestled down enough like Jacob. We've been wrestled down enough, but still, there's still a degree there of me coming back to say, okay, ready for more. Not yet fully broken. I cannot meet the demands of this church or my personal life you cannot meet the demands that seem to be around you in the flesh. But God can. Today should be a day to reflect on this message. And if you leave here with something really important, because I've, I've, I've said this to you before in many different ways, but this one, it goes deep for me. You know, I, I think sometimes we hear things and we don't, we don't let them settle in. I remember Dr. Scott, he used to say he always had a, an insurance policy, a plan B in case God didn't. Do you remember that? <laughs> well, I'll have that. And I'm not saying that planning is not good and having a plan B is not good. But if we're wanting God to solve our toughest problems, our greatest issues, you've got to be brought to this point here where if God doesn't do it, there are consequences. Guess what, folks? Until you come to that point, God will not fill the vessels. The glorious part of this is when you do come to this point, he begins to fill, and he does not stop filling the vessel until he has completed the work. That's a lifetime. That's not an instant of filling. It's a lifetime. So if you came here today with maybe a little bit of heaviness like I had, or maybe you're just trying to figure out what can I do, then I hope you make the discovery with me. If you've heard it once and if you've heard it before, I want you to hear it again. Because this is where the rubber meets the road. I think of all the things that could happen, of all the things that I would desire, obviously I want this church to be healthy. And the more I try to press in and tell some of you, I can't save anybody. You can't save anybody, but God can. He does it through surrendered vessels. Not the ones you see that are trying to, you know, I've said to you before, the ones, the people, and you've had exposure to them, the ones that are trying to win you down, they'll win you down to the ground, and then they'll get you into the kingdom. And then they walk away, and they got another one on my belt. It's not the way it goes. And the most blessed people are the ones who've been brought into the kingdom. You were, you were in the church, friends. You were here for many years, but you didn't get here completely, wholly, as you need to be until you were brought to the point of being emptied of the capacities, of the thought processes, of the ideas. And then the beginning of God occurred. Until then... You're going to be doing a lot of wrestling and trying to meet a lot of demands you cannot fulfill. I pray that you take this message today, and I pray that you take comfort in the fact that uh, this isn't meant to be some dismal setting. This is meant to give the encouragement to those people that are here who desperately need help. This isn't let God and let go and let God. This is, this is to say to you, if you have a problem, we sing a song, there, there isn't a problem that God can't solve or he can solve them. Sure he can. Most of the time he does great problem solving when you get out of the way because you're probably part of the problem. That was so pastoral, I just want to tap myself on the back. <laughs> what I'd like to say to you before we uh, all get up and want to do something else and leave saying, thank God I'm out of the cloud now. I want you to just take a second. I don't want you to answer aloud. I don't want people standing up. I don't want you raising your hands. I just want you to take a second, and I want you to think of whatever it is that seems to be pressing your way. 
Are you ready to let God handle that problem? Because if you are, he will. That's the kind of God we serve. Heavenly Father, I ask you today that you would help every soul in this sanctuary and in the sound of my voice to learn this lesson, to take it to heart, and to apply it, because we sure do need your help and your hand in the things that are so great. But for you, there's nothing that's impossible. We thank, we thank you for all that you do, all that you've done, and we thank you for this day to gather together to get strength for the battle ahead. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. That's my message. I'm Pastor Melissa Scott, pastor of Faith Center, Glendale, California. I teach every Sunday morning at 11 a.m. If you'd like to attend services with us, simply call the 800 number, that is 800-338-3030, to join us. If you'd like to watch, listen, and learn 24 hours a day, simply log on to our website at www.pastormelissascott.com.